Team, you may be seated. My name's Caleb Herring. I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad you are with us this morning. Um, or if you're online, we're glad you're tuning in uh, either today or maybe later this week. I uh, just want to give you guys a little bit of what's happening in October, if you forgot since last week. We have a couple events. Put them in your calendar, Google Docs, whatever you need. October 14th, we're going to have a little board game night where we'll have an opportunity to connect with one another, just enjoy fellowship, but also a little bit of competition. If anybody likes to compete and, you know, play games and win, which I'm going to teach you something. I just learned this this week. This is win in sign language. This is win. Can you do this with me? I learned this this week. You're about to learn something in church today. Someone's going to ask you, hey, what'd you learn at church? I learned how to sign win. Do you want to know what lose is? <laughs> no, not an L for loser, but um, you put your hand out and you got like two fingers and you go like you're dead, like you died. Yeah, you lost. You're dead. That's what losing is. It's kind of sad. Yeah, you don't want to be this guy. You want to be this guy. Um, so today, we're so glad you're here today. Um, we're going to continue in worship. We're going to talk about um, this person in the Bible that Jesus has. He has a second healing, and it's something you don't see. And this is a lot of people we see in the world that they, they put on the outside like they're doing okay. But what is really needed is this thing that needs to happen on the inside. We're really good at kind of covering up things on the outside. And, and for the instance this week, or this Sunday's text, like there's no hiding what's going on in this man's life and his friend, or at least the people he's with. And yet he gets two healings, one that's on the outside and one that's on the inside. And so I'm, I'm excited for you guys to hear that because I think it might be something that Jesus is teaching us today. But last week I actually... Um, was kind of a little bit, uh, I don't know if the right word is convicted, but um, wanted to change the way we approached Sunday, at least for today. Sometimes I'm up here and I say, hey, God has something for you today. May your ears be open and may your eyes be, be able to see what that is. And I want to shift that a little bit today. I want us to be coming in this morning just with the mindset, I want to be with God. And that's it. I'm here for God. And that's it. Like, that would be enough. Could that be enough? And maybe if you're not a believer today and you're kind of still kind of figuring this thing out, you know, uh, that, that can be kind of hard. And I want to encourage you just to sit with us in that moment because I believe, and I think you believe too, when you're with God, when you're for God and you want to be with him, things start to change in your heart and in your life. But we're not, going to talk, we're not going to worry about that right now. All I want us to be thinking about today, right now, as we continue in an act of worship through singing song, and maybe you want to give today and you brought your check and you can put it in the back of the sanctuary. There's a little basket or you can do it online. That's a way we can worship. But right now, we're going to, I'm going to invite us all to stand back up and allow this time, like, hey, I'm just here to be with God. I could be anywhere on a Sunday morning. I could be mowing my lawn. I could be watching the NFL game in London. I could be, you know, catching up on the news. But today you're here, and I want to encourage you and invite you. It's like, can you just come to be with God? And our song and our words and our heart and our mind and our eyes would just be focused on that. And then let that be something that we just start with. Can we do that today? Let me open us up in a word of prayer. God, thank you for being here among us. And God, we, we want to be, be here because you're here. And, and, that, and we believe that you are here. And so that is a, may that be enough for us right now. And maybe that's a small step for some of us. And maybe that's a big step for some of us, God. But help us to have a mind and eyes and heart and, and ears just to be with you. So we, we thank you that you're here, and we pray that you would hear our voices, you would hear our heart, and that would be pleasing to you because we want to be with you, just like a child wants to be with his father, just like a best friend wants to be with his best friend, just to be in their company today. And so we come for you this morning. Amen.
So 
seated. I'm going to invite you to continue this moment of worship by praying together as a church. And we've done this a few times where I'll, let's go to the next one. I'll say God of grace, or today I'm actually going to change that God of mercy, and you would say hear our prayer. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for superintendents, pastors, and deacons. Inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your mighty deeds, that your saving faith may be known to all. Hear us, O God. Wait, yeah, I'm sorry. God of mercy. Majestic God, we give you thanks for land and water, seed time and harvest. Break down boundaries we construct between ourselves and the rest of your creation. Bring renewal and restoration to places affected by pollution and deforestation. God of mercy. Mighty God, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, neighborhood, and world who work for justice and peace. Guide those who govern to act on behalf of those marginalized by race, ethnicity, or religion. God of mercy. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of those in need. Restore to community those who are stigmatized by illness, feel rejected, or who live in isolation. Send healing to all who suffer. God of mercy. Faithful God, we give you thanks for the healing ministries of this congregation. Equip those who visit, care, and pray for the sick. Give insight to doctors, nurses, home health aides, and all practitioners of medical arts. God of mercy. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. Renew our trust in your eternal promises of mercy, redemption, and new life. God of mercy. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all of God's people said... Anne Bartlett, and I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19 in the NIV. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Thank you, Anne. Uh, in our house, we have these boxes that I walk by almost every day. They're in our office. I don't know if you have any boxes with stuff in it that's like just hasn't been taken care of yet. We, we've been moved into our new house for a couple months now, but the boxes that are left are the ones that are the pictures and the decorations, the little, you know, catchy phrases like, you know, God's grace is enough. You know, there's some, it's on like a special, you know, framed art piece, and it's really, really pretty, but we haven't put it up anywhere in our house because it just doesn't seem to fit yet. You know, we have these nice walls, and we don't know our plan for what we want to do on them, and poking holes in them without a plan just seems like wrong. They're so nice looking. And I, maybe it's just something new to me because I haven't painted my own room or my own house or anything like that in decades since I was a teenager, and I was helping my parents do that. And, 
you know, we don't want to do that yet because we just don't have a place for it. Maybe you have some things on your kitchen counter that have been there for a couple weeks. You just don't have a place for it, and it just sticks on your kitchen counter. I don't know if you have any of those things. Or perhaps you have a drawer they go in. It's been called a junk drawer. All the little things that don't have a place, you're not sure where it belongs, you just kind of, it just piles up in one spot, right? Or, or perhaps it's a closet. You know, people are coming over, and you're like, oh, I better put all these things away, but you don't have a, you don't know where to put it. So you just kind of stuff it out of sight. It's in a closet somewhere. Um, but, you know, this is kind of what we, we notice. The small things seem to pile up. I don't know if, I have three drunk drawers. I don't know how this happened, but we have like a, a drunk drawer for cords and for all this. It's all the same stuff, but it's just small things. So you can kind of tuck it away. And, you know, you probably have things similar to that where it just doesn't have a place to belong. But it doesn't affect the whole house, right? You can still have a really nice place, really nice. Everything's orderly, and I'm sure if I go over to your house, if you're organized like my wife, you have everything in a nice little spot. You've organized the pictures on the walls because you've lived there for a while. Maybe you have a nice centerpiece uh, you know, in, your, in your living room, and it could be a beautiful picture. It could be really nice curtains. Maybe it's a TV for you. you know, this, or maybe it's a coffee table, and there's this really cool book or this really cool you know, object art. And it's kind of a centerpiece, right? You know, if, if that wasn't there, then the room wouldn't be whole. It wouldn't be complete. Well, what if I was to come over and, and say something to you maybe about your house or about your room, and I'd said something like, hey, you're missing something big. Hey, you know what? This, this room is it's just missing something. And you might be looking at me as like, no, I've got it exactly how I want it. I'm, an, I'm like an interior decorator amateur. I've watched all the home and garden shows you can get your hands on. Or I've got the magazine, and you've worked hard to make your room, your house, maybe your office just right, your desk is all put together. And I came in and said, hey, you're missing something big, which would mean everything would have to change. If I put this big piece of furniture in your room, it would have to cause you to change everything else around, wouldn't it? Or perhaps this beautiful piece of art, and it just doesn't match with anything else, You'd have to change. Now, what if there was something that, you know, I had to give you, this something big, that would create a space for all of those little things? It might require you to move some things around and take some things out, but it would actually give a space for everything in your house. And it'd be the same thing for the person next door to you and their neighbor, your neighbor. Like there is this something that's so big that it would be able to tie everything together. Yeah, you'd have to move some things and maybe pull some things out, but it would tie all of the things to be together. But this is a problem. Most people don't want to redecorate, right? It's almost kind of a big chore to have to move all the furniture. These days you have to get someone else to do it for you because you can't lift, you know, the big armoire or the big couch or the big recliner. You have to get someone to help. Uh, well, you might just be happy with where you're at. And, and today, I think, you know, where we find ourselves in, in the text with Jesus on this journey to Jerusalem, he has these followers that are disciples who are walking with Jesus, and they are happy with how everything is working out. They're not even mentioned in the story. They're not even mentioned in the story. They're, they're almost bystanders. And I want us today kind of put ourselves in their, in their, in their shoes watching the story unfold in a place where everything is going good for them because Jesus has got his eyes and his words towards others and they're next to Jesus hearing all this unfold. But at the end of the day, they're going to see something that's incredibly important for what's going to happen later on in the story. So I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 17, verse 11. This is where we find ourselves, the NRSV, uh, and I'm sorry, I did not change the LNLT to the NIV, so if you saw some words that were a little different from what you're hearing and reading, that's because that was my fault. Um, but on Luke 17, verse 11, it says this, Jesus, on the way to Jerusalem, was going through a region between Samaria and Galilee. So, kind of like the borderlands, in between two regions, Samaria and Galilee, as he entered a village... Ten lepers approached him, keeping 
their distance. Now, you might be wondering, why are they keeping their distance? I'll tell you in just a minute. These lepers called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And there was a system for the lepers. Can we change the HDMI to in the back, Joe? Is it on the right one? There was a system for lepers, and Jesus knew this. They were at a distance, and this is what the lepers knew to be true about when you have leprosy, and perhaps you know it's in the Old Testament before Jesus came. There's all this text about how Israel's, Israelites are supposed to live and, and follow this God, this God of Israel. And this were some of the things that uh, were shared with the Israelites. How are you supposed to act if you're a leper? It says in verse 2 of Numbers, command the Israelites to put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or who has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the corpse. So if you are a leper, you're supposed to be outside the camp. This is where we find our story today. We're in between the borderlands. They're outside of the city. Also, this is what else is, the Lord spoke to Moses saying this in Leviticus, long before Jesus came you know, to the scene, God's teaching the, the Israelites how to, how to act. He says, this shall be the ritual for the leprous person. At the time of his cleansing, he shall be brought to the priest. And Jesus knew all of this. He was very familiar with his culture, his, the rules that God had put in place, the system for lepers. And so what does Jesus do? This is what we find in the text today. Jesus says this. He says in the next verse, oh, let's go one more. Can you move this slide over for me? I don't know if my clicker's working. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. So he says to these ten lepers, go and show. So everything's working right now. As they went, they were made clean. So they're going, they're being made clean. Everything is working the way it should. Lepers being told where to go. They were right in the right spot. But something in the story doesn't, you know, we have this story in here for a reason. So let's keep reading. This is what happens. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned to back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. So he throws his body down on the ground and thanks Jesus. And then the text gets really interesting because it says this next. And he was a Samaritan. Let's keep going. Then Jesus asked, we're not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Is this text all about just minding your manners? One comes back out of all the ten, and he thanks Jesus. And perhaps you've heard this text before, and perhaps someone's been pre preached about it and you've read it, and at the service level you're thinking, oh, mind your manners. Be thankful. When I was at the dinner table growing up, my dad taught me how to mind my manners. He would make sure we all knew how to hold the fork properly. Where you've, I mean, you had a special way to hold the fork because he grew up in Texas, um, and there was a lot of, you know, his parents taught him all these things. And plus, my dad worked in the, the food industry, he was a chef, and so he had a lot of value on food and how it was eaten, how it was prepared, and so he all taught us how to, to hold the fork right. I remember uh, one of the children had a mirror at the table so they would see how bad they were eating when they ate because they, they were so sloppy. I won't tell you what child that was, but that was just a way to try to emphasize, hey, it's really important to mind your manners. Now today, my, my uh, practices of our kids minding our manners is if they burp, there's a little mercy, at the table, they get away. I don't know if they get away with it. They have mercy. If it happens again, it's five jumping jacks. I won't tell you who at the table does the most jumping jacks. You can ask Christine later. It's someone above the age 10. Um, so are these other nine people who were healed? I mean, where are, do they just not have good manners? I think Luke is causing us to think a couple things. First off is this. Why does he turn back? Why does he turn back? I 
And this, why the emphasis on his nationality? I mean, verse 16, it says, and it was like a whole, it's all to itself. And he was a, Jesus, verse 18 said, this foreigner. I mean, there's an emphasis here. And if you don't know much about this uh, culture difference between Samaria and Galilee, they were rivals. I mean, Jesus at one point uh, was speaking to a Samaritan woman and says, hey, you worship here and it's not right. You've created another way to come to God at a different mountain. No, the way to come to God is through this place of worship, the system that was created. So, and there was all throughout the generations this back and forth between Samaria and, you know, say Israel, the Israelites or Galilee, being back and forth. Samaritans were looked down upon. They, they were intermarried uh, nationality. It was, it was just something people didn't have a fond affection of each other. So why the emphasis on his nationality? Why did he turn back? What is the problem? So what is the problem here that we're trying to... Is the problem the, that the nine lepers are rude? I mean, is that what we're trying to, to get out of this? And I'm going to take a little leap here. I think it's a small leap. Jesus makes a real big point about this man being a Samaritan. I'm going to imagine the other nine were not Samaritans. I'm just going to be curious for a little bit that perhaps the other nine were Israelites, Galileans. And on this borderland, leprosy brought them together. There's ten of them. And so were the other nine just rude? Are we supposed to learn like, oh, you know, that's the problem. These guys were just rude. Maybe it was this. We need to know, we need more gratefulness. The problem is we just don't have enough gratefulness in the world. And, and last week I talked about having a discipline of thanklessness. And you might have been sitting in your chair and be like, Caleb, I mean, I'm a parent. I do things all the time nobody thanks me for. Right? Your two-year-old never thanked you when you changed their diaper, did they? I mean, is that true or not? They never thank you. Maybe when they're 22, they look back and be like, oh my gosh, you did so much for me. Thank you. But a lot of you are doing thankless jobs. And is this story just saying, it's like, hey, yeah, there's not enough thanks in the world. We need more gratefulness. Or maybe sometimes you're just like this. I have no idea, Caleb. Tell me. I have no idea. There's sometimes I come to a text like, I have no idea what's going on here. It seems so simple on the top, but perhaps there's more to it. This is what I think. And I want to incur- I want to invite you into thinking through this with me. This is what I think is going on. The problem is the system is broken. The system is broken. You have all those little pieces in that little drawer, or at least I do. What if those pieces have a place and the whole rest of the house, the big pieces in your house are wrong? What if there's another way to organize or another way to put things together where everything has a place, because this is what we find. A cure Samaritan is still a Samaritan. A cured Samaritan is still a Samaritan. This is what I mean by that. This man with the other nine, and pretend with me just for a second, who were all Israelites, were walking. He realizes, I'm cured. And then he looks up and he sees, I'm still a Samaritan. And they're still Israelites, and we don't get along. Let alone, I'm being asked to go to this place of worship, these priests that he doesn't necessarily belong to either. Are you following? He's being asked to go somewhere. And so he's thinking to himself, I imagine, imagine, he's thinking, I'm still a Samaritan. I'm cured, but I still don't belong with these people, or I don't feel like I belong. And I'm going to a place that I'm uncomfortable, or at least this is not my place of worship. It's a different. Maybe, maybe you've heard of, you know, this before. It's like, hey, you can take, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it this way. You can take the pastor out of Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the pastor. See, I'm from Texas. I, I made a Texas uh, flag pie yesterday for my friend who's from Texas because we know, like, we have a lot of pride in our state, for good or for worse. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. And 
you can't take that out of me. And that's what the Samaritan was feeling. Maybe you've heard this before. You could take the person, the boy, the girl, the woman, the man out of the trailer, but you can't, the trailer park, but you can't take the trailer park out of the man, the woman, the girl, the boy. Do you, do you sense what I'm saying? He didn't belong and he knew it. But God created this system, right? God created this temple, this place to worship, this place to come before. I mean, you heard it in, in, the, in the Old Testament. It's like he created this place. Why couldn't he go to it? Well, if, you've, if you read the first couple chapters of the Bible, there's, there's this place where God created the garden, and it was beautiful and it was perfect. Then what happened? Humans showed up. We ruined the system, or we broke the system, or we, we brought, you know, a sin into the world. And so anything and everything that we see God put in place, at some point, and you can see this, read this, throughout the stories of the Israelites, it's like at some point, we mess it up, where we have to create two places of worship in order to come to God. Like, there's an Israelite Jewish way to come to God and then there's a Samaritan way to come to God because it wasn't working because humans were involved. At some point in this generations of, of, of the Samaria and the Galileans, like they said, we can't get along. We're going to create our own way to worship God. So if the system's broken, if, if the way that God created is broken, what's the plan? What is God's plan? Does it change? Is it still the same? How does it move forward? How are we going to get to this place of, okay, here we go. We're going to get it right this time. Well, he shows us through the Samaritan. This is what's, what's so great. At the very end of the text, it says this. He said to him, the Samaritan, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And perhaps your translation and the one you heard, it says like your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well, has made you complete. Now think about the implications of this. Having a man who's healed on the outside and healed on the inside being sent out. What do you think that does for his family? Or maybe anywhere he goes. If a person who is complete on the outside and on the inside goes into a place, what kind of good would be following him? What are like I think of uh, Psalms 23. Perhaps you know the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be. What was that? I shall not want. There we go. I shall not want, I shall not be in want. The last verse, I imagine the last verse in Psalms 23 is what this guy was more connected with. You know the last verse? Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Everywhere this guy goes, now that he's complete on the outside and on the inside, love and goodness is following him everywhere. There's like this path. Wouldn't that be nice to be run and encounter this person who's healed on the outside and the inside? And perhaps today you would like that. You're like, man, I, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, in pain on the outside, but that's okay. I deal with it. But I have some things on the inside that need some healing. Man, how great would that be if today you left a little more healed on the inside. It's great to be healed on the outside. I'd say, man, if we could, if we could help and support as a church and, and connect you with the right people and, you know, maybe it's a, a visit to the doctor to help some things on the outside, to, to healing. Like, and we believe, you know, there could be supernatural healing, healings too, but imagine a whole person walking in and out of houses, neighborhoods, community, how that would affect that neighborhood. Imagine a hundred people maybe, every week, going out into their community, their neighborhood, their family, their workplace, being whole on the outside and whole on the inside. I mean, wouldn't that be a blessing to your workplace to have someone that was not insecure all the time? Who wasn't so worried about everything and filled with fear? It's okay to be, you know, have like healthy fear, but for it to debilitate you kind of fear? Wouldn't it be nice if we had healthy and strong relationships and marriages because you're complete and you're whole? And this is what Jesus shows us through the Samaritan. You are the plan. You are the plan. And, and let me make sure I caveat it, centered 
on Jesus because I don't want you to get too big-headed. You cannot, you've got to be able to fit through the doors on your way out. That's what my mom always said. She'd make sure to give me a taste of humble pie. It's like, hey, your head's getting too big. You can't fit through the door. And she'd give me a little taste of humble pie. I ate a lot as a, to- a teenager. You are the plan. But centered on Jesus, you are the plan. A healed on the outside and on the inside into the world. I want to invite our worship team forward. And they're, they're going to lead us in one more song. But I want us to, there's four things in this text we see that if we're centered on Jesus, these are the things that would happen. We'd seek mercy, right? These people were seeking mercy for the ailments that they had. Maybe today there's something today that you have physically that's going on in your life. And, they, and, and today is a chance to just seek mercy. Asking God, I'm dealing with this. I need your mercy. I can't deal with it myself. You see also, getting on your knees. The man that comes back, he falls flat, prostrate, worshiping. And this is one I, I think perhaps we don't do enough of just worshiping God. Getting on your knees. And so often in the Bible, anyone that comes to worship God or Jesus their body responds. For him, it was falling on his face, being prostrate. For others, it's getting on your knees. For others, it's putting hands out. I mean, all throughout, it's our body follows our heart. And perhaps, you know, as we move into this time of, of worship, song, music, I encourage you, there's an altar. There's places to come and have your body actively worshiping. Perhaps it's just sitting there. The other one is this, respecting the system. There might be things you don't agree with that you're dealing with at work or at home. As a young person, I, you know, it might just sound like, hey, life's not fair. It's not fair how they treat you. It's not fair. Like, that's kind of the system. And, and Jesus here isn't saying, you know, it's perfect. He's saying, respect it. This is the way it's set up right now. Respect it. Because eventually Jesus comes and he changes the system when he sits down with his disciples at the table and he breaks bread with them. Be in peace in the world. Going. And I brought, I, I brought something I want to help because um, this is just me being really, I get really excited about when the Bible comes uh, just alive in a way that's mathematical. I don't know if anybody has a math brain or thinks linearly like me, but there's this moment in, that I see that happens in the text. And if you can't see, you can move. And sorry to, to block you, Charlene. I'll move it later. There's this, this is what we see in the text. We see Jesus. And then we see all his disciples. This is what I was, they're bystanders right now. They're following Jesus. And who's on the outside? I'm going to say it. Who? The lepers. How many were there? They'd cry out to Jesus. Right? They're all crying out to Jesus. Have mercy on us. And Jesus says, go to the priest. What happens next? One of them realizes what? There, or one of them realizes he's been healed. What does he do? Okay. Then what happens? Yeah, he falls down, he worships him. And then where does Jesus send him? Back out. And this is what I notice when I, when I just put it out on a graph. And I'm sorry if you can't see it, you can walk up a little bit later. This is, what I, this is just me kind of wondering. There's all these things that are just centered around Jesus. They come to Jesus. He sends them out. They come back to Jesus. He sends them out. And the bystanders are noticing all this. And eventually, they're going to have the same conversation with Jesus. Go and make disciples. They've been with him. This is like a miniature, you know, 
uh, foreshadowing of what's happening. It even happens when uh, he sends them out, the 72. They come back and they report, and it was awesome. But this is what I want to ask us. What, what are we centering? I lost my clicker. What are we, what's our centerpiece? Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, put Jesus as your centerpiece. Where, where are we in this relationship with Jesus right now? Maybe today you need to come back and be worshiping. He's done so much for you, and he's just been good. And that's where you need to be, on your knees. Perhaps you just... You've just been kind of hanging out around Jesus, and you need to send him out today. You need to realize, like, God has a plan for you, and it's out there with your neighbor. And you need to be encouraged. Today, you have the ability. God has given you everything you need to speak, to serve, to give. Or perhaps it's just a confessing and admitting, Jesus, I have some things I need help with. Like, there's, where are you in the story? Where's your arrow pointing? And if it's been pointing one direction for a long, 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 long time, I encourage you, what's another one that perhaps he's calling you to today? Let me pray for you, and then I'm going to have Alyssa move forward, and I'll move this out of the way, and perhaps you want prayer, and I'd be happy to pray for you. But Lord, we thank you that you, you are good, God. And God, where we don't, we don't see that, may we see it right now. God, where we don't feel that, may we, may we don't understand that. God, would you, would you reveal those things through us, through your spirit? And God, where, wherever we might need to make a step today, help us to know what that step is. Or just give us the courage to take a different step because we've been in the same spot. We, we've been maybe seeking mercy and mercy and mercy but perhaps you're calling us to just worship. Now give us the courage to do it. And Lord, maybe there's, maybe there's a place you're calling us that's outside these walls that you want us to go. And we've been a little nervous about it or anxious about it or maybe dead to it. I don't know, God. Would you aliven that in our hearts and minds today? Lord, we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
spirits, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. dismiss us with our benediction. If Jesus is the centerpiece of your life, and I hope he is, and if he's not, you know, I think he's a great, he has a place for you in your life, in your room, somewhere. And maybe today you just take a step closer to making him the centerpiece. And, and him being a centerpiece means seeking mercy, getting on your knees, respecting the system, and then going out in peace. I want to encourage you this week, where can that, maybe what part of you centering on Jesus it looks like this week? So team, would you mind leading us out? God is so good.